Welcome to Arise America. I'm Andrew Schmertz. From the moment the opening bell rang, investors stormed the exits faster than they could order a New York City pizza. 30 minutes after the close, it's quiet outside the New York Stock Exchange. As you can see from this live picture, the Dow Jones Industrial Average suffered the worst intraday point loss in history and by the end of the day was off 1,176 points or 4.5%. The market has paired all of the gains it had for the year. It has been down at one point today, 1,600 points. The S&P 500 also fell, 113, and the Nasdaq down 233. The Dow now down 1,800 points in two days. Well, this ride was sparked by any number of reasons, fears of higher interest rates, inflation, and stock valuations among them, but the political situation in Washington causing additional anxiety. The market the market slid on heavy volume today. That's not a good sign for the bulls. The 5% drop is on top of 2% Friday. Now, a 10% drop is generally considered correction territory. In other news, a stunning rebuke from the latest judge sentencing admitted sexual molester Larry Nasser, the former Olympic doctor, sentenced to 40 to 125 years today. The judge's rebuke was aimed at authorities this time who ignored years of evidence of Nasser's crimes. The acts he committed destroyed young lives, and families and shocked the world. As a Rise News reporter, Akasa Amulopu explains, news, new reports question how the doctor got away with it for so long. Disgraced doctor Larry Nasser entered court for the final of three sentencings for molesting young gymnasts amid new reports that he could have been stopped earlier. You took an oath to do no harm, and you have harmed over 256 women, and that is beyond Families say that the number of Nasser victims could have been lower if the FBI had acted with more urgency when it first received complaints in 2015. The New York Times identifying at least 40 girls and women who say Nasser molested them between July 2015 and September 2016 when Nasser was exposed by the Indianapolis Star. The FBI declining to answer detailed questions as to speed of its investigation, suggesting that the allegations transcended jurisdictions, indicating efforts to coordinate may explain the FBI's slow tempo. It is unfathomable to think about the number of victims that would have been spared had authorities acted upon the complaints received years ago. But that is a discussion for a different time and a different place. Today, the issue for this court, the responsibility of this court, is to exercise the authority that I do have to protect society from you, which is what I intend to do. Nasser has listened to the accusations of dozens of victims and even survived an attack by a distraught dad. I can't Would you give me that. one minute? <laughs> I, you know that I can't do that. That's not how our legal system works. Well, <laughs> Something good must come from this. It may be hard to see from where we stand now, but already much good has come from this pain and hardship. Voices of victims are supported and believed and are heard like never before. Victims and their parents realize that they are not alone, that they are not the only ones with these feelings of shame and guilt and confusion and anger. Young women have been and are empowered to stand up for themselves. And now we can be sure that a group of determined women can transform into advocates of change. That won't stop and end here when he is taken away for the last time today. The admitted molester then tried to apologize again. The words expressed by everyone that has spoken, including the parents, have attacked me to, uh, to my innermost voice. With that being said, I understand and acknowledge that it pales in comparison to the pain, trauma, and emotions that you all feel. It's impossible to convey the depth and breadth of how sorry I am to each and every one of all. The visions of your testimonies will forever be present in my life. 
Judge Janice Cunningham then added another 40 to 125 years to the more than 200 years Nasser has already been sentenced in three cases. Ladies and gentlemen, this now ends the criminal legal proceedings involving Larry Nassar. I realize that it does not end the emotional and physical suffering he has caused. I am in awe of each of you and I appreciate your efforts to provide me with your statements, flying in from Europe, all over the country, submitting videos, taking time off work, missing classes, you basically put your lives on hold. You will always be in my thoughts and prayers. That is all. It may be all over for NASA now, but many institutions from Michigan State University to USA Gymnastics and now the FBI have to fully explain how they let the doctor get away with his actions for so long. Aki Saomulepu, Arise News. Federal investigators spent a second day Monday at the site of a deadly train crash in South Carolina. The National Transportation Safety Board is focusing on one critical factor. A switch set manually may have caused the passenger train to barrel down the wrong track, smashing it into a parked freight train. The crash killed two people and injured more than 100 passengers. The investigation could take years, but experts say the crash could have been prevented with a GPS-based system called Positive Train Control, which is designed to prevent two trains from traveling on the same track at the same time. Regulators have demanded the system for decades, but railroads have won repeated extensions to install the system. The deadline is now the end of 2018. Well, Philadelphia is cleaning up after the Super Bowl celebrations turned somewhat unruly overnight. Tens of thousands came out to celebrate the Eagles, defeat the New England Patriots. Celebrators climbed the city's famously greased light poles. That couldn't stop them, toppling them. Other rowdy, e rowdy Eagle fans smashed department store windows and looted a gas station. The vast majority of revelers celebrated peacefully, with police only making three arrests. In Washington, the nasty memo beat battle enters week two. Tonight, the House is voting on releasing the Democratic intelligence memo, which counters the GOP version released on Friday. The dueling memos cover warrants issued by a federal court that operates in secret when intelligence matters are concerned. The president weighed in this morning via tweet, Twitter. Our Washington chief correspondent, Eric Ham, joins us with the latest. So Eric, tonight the House Intel is gonna take up a vote to release the Dem memo. memo. This comes, of course, on the heels of Congressman Nunes' memo on Friday. What can you tell us on where that vote stands? Right, that, that, that's right, Andrew. We've got the battle of the memos right now, <laughs> and the House Intel Committee is actually taking up a vote probably within the next 20 minutes or so. And now, we just actually heard from Congressman Jim Hines, Democrat who's on the committee, and he informed us that actually uh, members of the Republican side have already told him that they plan to vote for the release of the Democratic memo. So he is expecting that this memo will actually get a thumbs up from the committee and that it should go to the president's desk where the president will then have five days to determine whether or not the memo will actually see the light of day. And I thought I saw that the White House said, quote, it hasn't made a determination about that. That's right. Now, keep in mind, with, with the Nunes memo last week, we saw that the president had made clear that he was going to release the memo even before he even read it. In <laughs> fact, he told a member of Congress uh, as he was exiting the, 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 ch the chamber on the night of the State of the Union that he was 100 percent sure that he was going to the re release the memo. And in fact, he did. So we are, we, we are curious to see if the president will actually uh, go through with the same uh, mechanism that he used for releasing the Nunes memo, this time to release the Democratic memo. Well, while lawmakers debate that, I understand President Trump was on Twitter this morning and it wasn't very pretty. Eric, what's the latest? <laughs> no, no, it, it was not, Andrew, it was not at all. In fact, uh, this morning, early in the morning, the president, as he is known to do, uh, took to Twitter to actually call out uh, members, not only of the Democratic Party, but former lawmakers and senior intel chiefs uh, for their efforts uh, regarding this. And uh, we can put the, the tweet up, I'll read it for you. It says here, uh, this is from the president, 
It says, little Adam Schiff, who is desperate to run for higher office, is one of the biggest liars and leakers in Washington, right up there with Comey, Warner, Brennan, and Clapper. And we know Col uh, Warner, that's a sen uh, Senate uh, member of the Intel Committee, uh, uh, Senator uh, Mark Warner from uh, Virginia. And what's interesting is Warner serves as the ranking member on the Intel Committee within the Senate, and he's working very closely uh, with his Republican counterpart. And we know that they have not, they were not privy to the Nunes memo before it was released. And in fact, they're working in a very bipartisan fashion in the Senate. So it's very interesting that he was included in the memo. We do know how the president uh, loathes uh, Jim, Co uh, Jim Comey, of course. But again, the president ramping up his attacks on the Intel Committee, on members who have led this country uh, in the intelligence in arena for a very long time. And it'll be interesting to see what the president will have to say if, in fact, this memo does uh, pass the House and gets to the president's desk. I thought Little was the nickname for Marco Rubio. He can't be happy that Adam Schiff has taken his uh, nickname. <laughs> uh, the president, first lady, meanwhile, trans, uh, transported themselves to Cincinnati today um, to address some people there. What are the details? Sure, they were in Ohio, and it's interesting because last week the president gave the State of the Union on Tuesday. Now, typically what happens is the president will get on the plane the very next day to tout the plans that he outlined in the State of the Union. Well, that didn't happen. In fact, here we are almost a week later, and the president is in Ohio touting tax cuts. Uh, he toured a, 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 a small company there, and also uh, the, the, the first lady, along with Kellyanne Conway, they visited the Cho Children's Hospital of Cincinnati. Now, what's interesting is uh, Governor Kasich was not there to actually greet the president. It was actually Senator Rob Portman who was, in a, who was there to greet the president today and also be with him throughout his tour. Now, I don't know if this is indication that uh, Governor Kasich is looking to possibly run against the president, but it was just something to, to keep in mind. It was very interesting that he was not there. But again, another trip for the president touting the success of the tax cuts. So while all this is going on, we have this little detail still out there that the government runs out of money this week. Another shutdown looming or a lawmaker is going to strike a deal to keep the government open? You know, it's like deja vu all over again. First we've got the memo, now we've got uh, possibly running out of funding, but it looks like this time neither the Republicans or Democrats want to see a shutdown. And so I think what you will see are members from both sides of the aisle actually just cringe and bear it and actually sign another uh, a, a short-term extension to keep the government open. Democrats feel that they got burned during the last shutdown. And then also we're seeing that there are some members who, who, who are looking to actually punt on the Dreamers issue for at least one year. Now, we do know that Senator John McCain and, and Senator Chris Coons actually have legislation that they have drafted to address the Dreamers issue. It offers a pathway to citizenship, but what it does not do is provide full funding for the wall. And so the president has made clear that this bill is dead on arrival. But, a, but one interesting point is there is a similar piece of legislation in the House that would work very well with this bill. So it'd be, it will be interesting to see if it gets, if it gets uh, uh, supported and passed. Uh, and, and sent to the sent to the house for uh, for them to take a vote on it. Yeah, and we're going to have a little bit more later in this show on the McCain Coons bill. Eric Hammond, Washington. Thank you. Next on Arise America, more on the market meltdown and a word from former Fed Chief Janet Yellen. You're watching Arise America. Stay with us. As mentioned, it's a raucous start of the week on Wall Street, and that tops the business news. The Dow Jones Industrial Average ended the day down 1,176 points, or 4.6 percent. It was down better than 1,600 points at one point. A 5 percent correction is um, in the works right now. A 10 percent drop is usually considered a correction. Valuations, rising interest rates, inflation generally considered what's behind the sell-off. The White House did comment on it, says that it's concerned about the sell-off, but overall the economy is strong. Wells Fargo is facing an unprecedented penalty from federal regulators. The bank has already been fined $180 million for creating bogus customer accounts, allegedly to boost how its accounting looked. Last September, the Senate held hearings into the consumer abuses. Okay, from here. Scam came to light. You have said 
repeatedly, quote, I am accountable. But what have you actually done to hold yourself accountable? Have you resigned as CEO or chairman of Wells Fargo? The board, I serve at have the- Have you resigned? N no, I've not. All right, have you returned one nickel of the millions of dollars that you were paid while this scam was going on? Well, first of all, this was by 1% of our people I, and- That's and, not my question. My question, this is about responsibility. Have you returned one nickel of the millions of dollars that you were paid while this scam was going on? The, the board will take care have of that. Have you returned one nickel of the money you earned while this scam was going on? And, and the board will do- I will it. take that as a no then. Well, now the Federal Reserve says Wells Fargo cannot enter or expand its business until it, quotes, proves that it cleans up its act. Well, if you ever wondered why you get distracted at work, Microsoft has the answer. You're watching too many cat videos. The tech giant conducted a study of 20,000 workers in Europe about how they use digital media. At companies with a, quote, poor digital culture, about 21% of people said they are less productive because of social media and videos on YouTube. Microsoft recommends companies train workers in the proper use of email and how to avoid looking at Facebook all day. How about you just don't look at cat videos? Next, new moves on immigration reform today in D.C. We'll have reaction. Stay with us here on Arise America. The immigration debate continues on Capitol Hill as two senators unveiled a bipartisan compromise today that would protect dreamers and also boost security on the Mexican border. But President Trump has dismissed it as saying any deal needs to fund his border wall. Joining us now to discuss these latest developments is longtime immigrant activist Ravi Ragbir, who is also the executive director of the New Sanctuary Coalition. Ragbir has fought for thousands of people facing detention and deportation, and he himself could be deported this week for a 2002 wire fraud conviction for which he has already served time. Welcome, Robbie, and thank you for joining us. Uh, let's start with the political news out of Washington. Senators McCain and Senators Kuhn, Republican, Democrat, have come up with this proposal to sort of codify what's known as DACA, the mm -hmm. Dreamers, in exchange for some additional funding on the Southern Wall. The president says they're wasting their time. Any thoughts about what's going on right now? Well, unfortunately, um, we have never expected any form of compromise on this. Uh, uh, we, in, in November 9, 2016, um, all of these programs, TPS and DACA, we expected this administration to slash, and they have done so. And the only reason that we have seen DACA still on the table is because of the great mobilization by the community to protect the young people who are in this crisis. So there may, there may be a bipartisan um, deal from McCain and Coons, but is it going to go anywhere? I don't expect um, anything to come out of it, um, especially as he's so f firm on the border wall, which is going to cost billions of dollars and which even though he, he said he's going to send a bill to Mexico, seriously, are we going to get that? Well, let me ask you something. Would you support it? And I've heard some Democrats say, heck, they'll agree to the border wall of some form mm -hmm. if they get the Dreamers protected. Is that something that the immigrant community would support? In, in fact, the border wall will not solve the problem. So uh, looking at it from that point of view, um, yes, if they, we could. Um, support a border wall. I'm not saying I will support a border wall, but if you think in the border wall is going to support um, any type of, of um, policy, a good immigration policy, it's not going to help. The, the only other, the problem though is not just the border wall, but what the militarization on the border wall, which is the drones, the, the, you know, I was in Arizona recently and you saw the, the military aircrafts taking off every half an hour um, just to monitor what is happening on the border. Um, you know, there's about 122 immigrants, from what I understand, to lose their DACA protection mm -hmm. every single day. Uh, if DACA expires, what do you think the community is going to do? Are they going to go back underground, uh, or are they going to they're going to face deportation? So, what is the what is their outlook? The outlook is bleak. They expect to be taken in by by this this agency, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, because they are going after the low hanging fruit. They're looking. They have the all the information of these people. Um, every single DACA recipient, beneficiary, um, over 800. Um, so they would 
800,000. Yeah. 800,000, sorry, mm -hmm. expect to be taken away. Um, the good news is um, they, they still have legal options. Um, the New Sanctuary Coalition has a training for how to protect themselves, how to protect their families so that they are not deported um, under this administration. You have a fascinating story. You were born in Trinidad. Correct. You have lived here for 30 years. Your wife and daughter are U.S. citizens. Uh, back in 2002, I understand, you, 2000, faced 2000, you faced a wire fraud conviction for working with a mortgage company, I understand. Correct. Right? Uh, but you served your time. Correct. Uh, then you faced deportation. And now you face deportation again. Where does your case stand? Um, so my lawyers, and I have a really good lawyers from the New York um, University Immigrant Rights Clinic, mm -hmm. who have been looking at my, my case and looking at the options available. And they are seeing options available. In fact, we are hearing on Friday to look at the underlying criminal conviction that makes me deportable. I have a green card. Well, I had a green card. But because of the You were here illegally. I was here with a green card. Right. I don't like to use the word legally and illegally because Fair. for a piece of paper, Fair enough. it doesn't make me any less of a human. Right. So they, they are looking to, um, um, to challenge the underlying conviction. Yet, um, that's on February 9th. This is this Friday. On February 10th, I am told to go to immigration to turn myself in to face deportation, not allowing the court any time to look at this, not to allow the court any time to, to make a decision on this. They are hoping that um, the judge will, um, will not make a decision, but it think, they think that they will be allowed to take me away because they assume that the stay that the court has issued is going to expire. Now, you were at the State of the Union address. Correct. Uh, how did, that's pretty neat. How did that come around? And, you know, what was the reaction of lawmakers when you were there? Did you get a chance to speak to anybody, specifically speak to anybody from the other side? So, yeah, it was bizarre. Uh, Monday night, I was in detention. On uh, Tuesday night, I was You're in, in Congress. the state. <laughs> yes. And in the, the halls, right? So right. it wasn't just, um, we expected that I would just be there to accompany um, Congresswoman Velasquez, who has been supportive of me. Um, we were able, we were fortunate enough to get a ticket through Congresswoman Clark, who is also supportive. Um, we did not meet anyone on the other side. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have time because this all happened in, in minutes. But I did speak with um, um, Senate Minority Leader um, Nancy Pelosi. Oh, okay, of the House. Of the House. Um, so we uh, House Minority Leader. House, and so she she expressed um, concern and support mm -hmm. for for my situation. Um, but it was very um, bizarre. It was in a I, like I was in a different reality, looking at this out of body experience. Why I'm in, I'm in the State of the Union, listening to the person who is. Um, basically authorizing my deportation and breakup of my family. Was there anything in the president's speech to e either give you hope or to make you more fearful? Uh, it was, w there, there was nothing in there to give me hope, was there? Uh, because he didn't address anything positive about the immigrant community. What he has shown is that he wants to criminalize the, the immigrant population, um, basically describing them as gang members. Um, as the um, MS-13, mm -hmm. that we equate in every single immigrant to the gangs, and therefore violence, and therefore uh, we should be deported. Not recognizing the work um, that people have put in, the, the, the valuable contributions they have made um, in the communities in New York City as much as everywhere else. And by the way, you're getting support across the board. Just yesterday, you were awarded the Bishop's Cross by the Episcopal Diocese of Long Island. Correct. Uh, for, quote, exceptional service to the church and to the community it services. What does that mean for you, and do you think it helps maybe your case a little bit as well? So they went, you know, they went one more step further than that. They actually made me a canon to the bishop, which is an advisory to the bishop. <laughs> Um, is the highest offer they can give to an honor day in person. Uh, it, it means that I am now um, come under the protection, the actual protection of the Episcopal Diocese. Hmm. So we don't know what it means, but we know that the, the diocese, the, the Episcopal in, um, Long Island Diocese, um, Bishop Provenzano, has expressed support. Uh, we are trying to figure out what is, how this will affect my case. Religious leaders have generally spoken about pro-immigration positions, but do you think that they have been vocal enough in this country at this specific time to protect immigrants? Not enough people are doing this. So there have been very, um, those who are speaking out are speaking out strongly about it. Uh, what we need to see is the Catholics 
for instance, um, not the, 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 the bishops, but more the, uh, the Catholic churches, individual churches that have to speak up um, about the issue, uh, about the, the concern that they, their own congregants face and look to create pro process to protect them. And we need to have more of, the, of those faith leaders stand up to protect um, the immigrant population, not the other way around where we see um, the, the um, faith leaders are saying, evangelists who are, uh, who are saying that immigrants should be removed, but they will, then they will, they will be excited to say, we have missionaries to those places, why not protect the people who are here from those countries who you talk about um, needing to have missionary, um, missionary, missionaries to, to convert and to share the good news. Okay, Robbie Rogbeer, good luck this Friday. Thank you. From the New Sanctuary Coalition. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Still to come, family leave marks a milestone. You're watching Arise America. Twenty-five years ago today, President Clinton signed into law the Family and Medical Leave Act. Since then, it's been used a hundred million times. Even so, 40 percent of workers are still not covered. With us to discuss this milestone and the work being done to improve upon it is Molly Weston Williamson, a staff attorney at A Better Balance, an organization which works to ensure that no one has to make a decision between their family and their job. Welcome to the program, Molly. Thank you. So first, give us an overview of what the Family Leave Act provides. Sure. So the Family and Medical Leave Act, more commonly called the FMLA, is a federal law that gives covered workers the right to up to 12 weeks of unpaid time off in one of four situations. So when you yourself have some kind of serious health need, so you need to recover from surgery or you're dealing with a chronic condition like asthma or diabetes, or when a close family member has the same kind of situation, uh, in order to bond with a new child, so if you're bringing home a new baby or adopting a new child, time to bond with that child. Uh, and last, for about the last 10 years, it's also covered some needs when a close family member is deploying with the military. Okay, but you, it's unpaid leave, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so how does that impact people who simply cannot afford to be away from their job for 12 weeks? It's a significant problem. So as you mentioned, nationwide about 40% of workers are not covered by the FMLA, but even for people who are covered, you need to be able to afford to take that time completely forgoing a paycheck or in some cases only getting partially paid if your employer chooses to do so. And that's a real problem for lots of families, especially for low income folks working paycheck to paycheck. Because when it comes down to it, if you can't afford to take the leave, it's kind of like you have no leave at all. Okay, now we have a map because the states are trying to improve upon mm -hmm. the law and change it. Uh, for example, I think New York has a pretty progressive, especially mm -hmm. New York City, progressive view of this. What have some of the states done to improve the act? So several states have actually come up with their own laws which create a right to paid leave, money in your pocket. When you're taking this leave, a lot of them actually provide even additional protections beyond that. So as you mentioned, New York actually for about a month now has a really groundbreaking law that provides a right to, right now it's up to eight weeks and eventually it'll be up to 12 weeks of paid job protected time off for a lot of those needs we just talked about to bond with a new child, to care for a seriously ill family member, or to address needs in connection with deployment. And a bunch of other states are doing the same. California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island already have paid leave laws in effect. And Washington, D.C. and Washington State have passed paid family and medical leave laws that'll start providing benefits in 2020. But is there concern is who's paying for this? The businesses, right? How, uh, what have the businesses responded to you about how they can afford this? Uh, and if it's hurting potentially hiring people in the future? So one of the things that's really great about all of the paid leave laws in the United States is they're all set up as insurance systems. Mm -hmm. Everybody pays in a little, and when you're out on leave, the system pays you back. Um, in most cases, it's actually employees who are paying into the system. So for example, here in New York, uh, the paid family leave component, that part is 100% paid for by employees, so it's no money out of pocket for businesses. Um, and we've heard these concerns sometimes when you're looking to pass these laws that it'll hurt businesses or people won't get hired. But when you look at studies out of states that have had these programs for the longest time, so for example, California's, which has been in effect since 2004, you find out that that's not really true. So when you survey business owners, you find that overwhelmingly, we're talking 85, 90%, they say it's good, it's, it's good or neutral for productivity and performance, it hasn't hurt hiring, all of that stuff. And I would say it provides the states maybe a competitive advantage mm -hmm. in attracting workers. 
Absolutely. And I think part of the goal there is also really to level the playing field. Because if you're a, a large technology corporation, if you're you know, a Facebook or a Google, you can afford to pay for these benefits out of pocket. But if you're a little bodega or a restaurant, you're not going to be able to afford that. And if you're an up and coming company, you want to be able to compete. Um, for the best talent, and these insurance systems help you do that. Um, there's mixed messages out of the Trump administration because you have the Trump administration attacking regulations that many people feel protect workers, mm -hmm. and you have the president's daughter, Ivanka Trump, being very vocal about expanding family leave and family help acts. Uh, where do you think this is going to fall out? I, I think that's the key question right now. You know, we've seen um, the start of some kind of proposals, though it's a little hard to evaluate without the full details in front of you and. What we've seen has led to some concerns about whether, if there were a proposal put forward, would it really be comprehensive enough to meet everyone's needs? Um, would it happen in a way that would not harm women? Um, and would there really be enough money to pay for the program? I, I think at this point what everyone's thinking is, we want to make sure that workers are protected in the rights they have now. And as we're building new rights, we really want to make sure that we're doing it right and not setting up a program that's not really going to do what it's supposed to do. You know, uh, many times people look to what other countries are doing. Specifically in Europe, they have different views of the worker-employer relationship. Do you know what um, other countries are doing in regards to family leave acts? So in general, the United States lags pretty far behind in this area. Um, according to the International Labor Organization, the United States is one of only two countries in the entire world that has no federal paid maternity leave benefit of any kind. It's the United States of America and Papua New Guinea. Everybody else has some kind of benefit. So we've got a lot of room to go in terms of catching up with our peers in other countries. Um, let's talk about medical issues because that wasn't always, pretend, always covered mm -hmm. under this. Have the medical reasons for medical disability be, been expanded under this act? So since the Family and Medical Leave Act was passed in 93, it's always contained strong protections for when you have what's called a serious health condition, which is some kind of health need that either is going to require inpatient treatment or ongoing treatment or supervision. And that can be a lot of different things. That could be recovery from surgery. That could be dealing with an acute condition. That could be something like diabetes or asthma. And that's always been protected. But what it doesn't help you with is everyday regular illnesses you get the flu, your kid gets pink eye, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's an area where states and cities across the country have stepped up to really bridge the gaps by passing paid sick days laws, which are now in place in over 40 jurisdictions across the United States, including nine states, um, which provide a right to paid time off for a couple of days a year when you or a member of your family is sick or injured or getting some kind of medical treatment. Um, so what is next in Washington, D.C. that you want to see kind of happen here? So there's a great federal bill called the Family Act, um, which would provide paid benefits when you're taking all of those things covered by the FMLA. So your own health, a family member's health, bonding with a new child in connection with deployment. Um, and that would be a really significant step forward. And, and bonding with the new child, it includes fathers, correct? That's exactly and right. And that's somewhat new. So that's something where the United States has actually done a pretty good job is in making sure that bonding leave is available to all kinds of parents. So moms and dads, adoptive and foster parents. The goal here is really that every kind of parent needs time to bond, not just parents who gave birth. Um, when you look at the labor market, and I wonder if this changes when the, there's a high rate of unemployment, do you find that it's harder to enforce this law because people need the jobs? You may be entering a t time with tighter labor markets and so workers have a little bit more negotiating room. Should workers ask these questions when they take jobs? So yes, you should definitely ask these questions about what are your rights, what are employer's policies, which often are a lot better than the minimum required by law. Um, I'll say when times get tough, um, it's harder. It's harder to stand up for yourself and your rights. It can be scarier to take the risk. Um, all of the laws we've talked about today have strong protections against retaliation or punishment, but the fact that it's illegal doesn't mean it doesn't happen, so people have to think about that. You know, our previous guest talked about immigrants' rights, and mm -hmm. I imagine in the immigrant community this is a big issue because there's often, often a lot of fear mm -hmm. that goes into this. How is your organization maybe reaching out to those people as well? So we run a free and confidential legal hotline in English and Spanish, and one of the things that's really important to us is that we can and do advise workers regardless of their immigration status. 
And that's something that we're really proud to be able to do. But it certainly enters into people's thought process about how comfortable you are standing up for your rights, even though lots of laws apply regardless of citizenship or immigration status, like New York's paid leave law, like the FMLA. It's really just a question of comfort level and making sure that we inform people and arm them as well as they can with the information they need to make the choices that are right for them. I would think if big businesses want this and workers want this, it would be an easier path. So who's opposing this? So it's funny because when you look at polls, mm -hmm. you see overwhelming numbers of people, including overwhelming numbers of Republicans, say in polls that they're in favor of a National Family and Medical Leave Act. And yet it's been a little bit of an uphill battle. Um, you've seen some groups that my colleagues sometimes call organized business step up to oppose this, often with really trumped up claims about um, negative impacts on hiring or on productivity or, or really misleading claims about what these laws actually do. Um, but I think we're, we're really hitting a breakthrough moment. We're seeing unprecedented momentum in states and localities passing their own laws. And I, I think we're really looking forward to the future and building on that, both at the state level and the national level. Molly Weston Williamson, thank you thank so you. much. Coming up, the Super Bowl ad that's raised a stir next on Arise America. The Super Bowl isn't all about the game. It's the biggest platform for advertising of the year. With us is Jeremy Goldman, the founder of C and CEO of Firebrand Group, a marketing company. Jeremy, I imagine you had to sit through the whole game, which is a good thing <laughs> because it was a terrific game. So which was your favorite ad? You know, it's really actually hard this year to say because there are so many that were effective, like the Amazon Alexa campaign. Uh, that was one of them. Obviously, the NFL had its own ad, which was pretty great. I think the to Toyota uh, ad focused on uh, uh, supporting uh, the Paralympics and kind of going a little bit bigger. That was probably my favorite. Okay, let's take a look at it and play it. Driven since I was a child They tell you life is a game But it ain't a game to me The lights are calling my name Yeah, I got the energy To put it all on the line If you knock me down I'll get up again I'll get up again If you knock me down I'll get up again I'll get up when we're free to move, anything is possible. So I thought this was a very effective ad because you didn't know where it was going. Yeah, you know, one of the trends that we actually saw this year, and this is what, why this ad was so effective, is that it elevates the brand. It's not just about the product, but it's about a feeling that uh, winds up increasing a lot more uh, customer loyalty, which is something that's in short, uh, to, you know, not a lot of people actually can relate to brands uh, these days. Right, it's a connect, you see this more in the Super Bowl or big event advertising. You see sort of the emotional connection, which kind of could cut both ways, right? But this year on balance, it was pretty good, you think? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, th there were a lot of, and I, I think part of what actually is uh, made a lot easier is the fact that these are so incredibly expensive ads. So if you're going to buy one. So it costs first $5 million for a 30 second spot. And then you had to produce the ad. Right, exactly. So do we have any numbers on how much you'd have to spend on these ads? Well, yeah. I mean, part of it is there. there is some variability there mm -hmm. depending on when you want something to play, place. But you raise a very important point, which is the creative time and the deliberative process means that a lot of these ads wind up being very effective in the end. Is it worth it for companies in the Super Bowl to be in the Super Bowl anymore? Uh, the short answer is it depends. Mm -hmm. If you have the ability to run multiple ads to reinforce a particular message, and if you're a consumer brand, then yes, it can definitely be effective. Uh, where you get into trouble is where you have a smaller uh, brand that puts its entire marketing budget for the year wrapped up in a 30-second ad that didn't necessarily hit where it should, should I think hit. the lock company 
used to do that. I forget the name of the company, but they bought their entire budget was on on, on the um, Super Bowl ad. So some of the other ads that were effective, do you think? Yeah, you know, one of the key things that was actually very, uh, and you saw this as a trend this year, as you saw this with um, Tide had an ad mm -hmm. uh, along these did lines. You, did you like that? The Tide, Tide spent a fortune, by the way. They yeah. must have bought half a dozen ads. Yep. Do you think that was effective? Yeah, you know, one thing that was really effective about it is, first off, uh, the average consumer is very cynical these days. So the fact that you were able to play into that cynicism in some way with like a wink, wink, nudge, and then say, are all of the ads actually tied ads because mm -hmm. everybody looks great in all the other ads, right. was very meta and effective. Um, and they need the PR at this point. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, let's let's talk about the Ram ad, which was the Martin Luther King ad, and I think we have that. Let's play the clip, and then we'll talk about it. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness. By giving that definition of greatness, it means that everybody can be great. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know the theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics in physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace. So generated by love. Well, everybody's talking about the ad. The question is whether you loved it or hated it because some are saying it really was exploitive of MLK statement. Right. I mean, I actually want to, if it's okay, just to kind of hit my head uh, in, <laughs> into this right now because it was exploitative and it had actually the, uh, the approval of the estate. Mm -hmm. That doesn't matter to a lot of people because we all feel a sense of you know, ownership of the ideals of MLK, and we never really thought that he was here to, you know, sell us. To sell uh, us a truck. Uh, yeah. I wonder if it was would have been better if you did not see a Ram truck in it. If they did the advertisement and then just tagged it in a way and not saw the product. Yeah. That may have been more respectful. Um, a lot of people are talking about the Eli Manning Odell Beckham ad. Uh, that was uh, that was a surprise ad. I think people kind of that's what made that ad pretty good. Yeah, and I think that's definitely done uh, a lot of positive things over the last uh, day. Uh, there's been a lot of. Uh you know, uh, YouTube views that have been attributed to that ad. So there's momentum. The key thing is, is that when a brand is putting together an effective ad, you have to be looking at what's going to be effective in the moment, but also what is going to have recall and a positive effect on sales down the line. Are these one-time hits generally, or do companies now reuse them over after the Super Bowl? So generally what they do is they play on that campaign in some way, shape, or form. Because when you're going to do a very expensive setup for an ad, you want to figure out how can you extend this in some way. You know, if you get Peter Dinklage uh, mm -hmm. to do an ad for you as he did uh, to create a And that was brilliant. They combined two brands, yeah. Doritos and Mountain Dew, yeah. uh, into one. Yeah, into essentially like a, a you know, a, a rap, rap battle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and if you're going to do something like that, you want to make sure that you can extend that campaign, uh, which then uh, studies show Im improves uh, people's recall of the initial campaign itself. So we're, we have about 30 seconds left. Ratings were down this year. Does that factor into advertisers maybe next year? Uh, you know, or any of the controversy the NFL has faced? Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily. I think part of the, the key thing is that everybody tends to talk about ratings down. What does that mean for next year? Most pundits wind up getting it wrong in terms of what that means for next year. So, you know, hard to, uh, hard to say. A lot of it is probably wait and see. But this is one of the few things that you can buy, uh, you know, any type of media where you can uh, ensure that you're going to get a large portion of the population. Every Super Bowl, people talk about the game but more so the ads. Jeremy Goldman, thank you very much. Pleasure. For joining us here on Arise. That's Arise America for this Monday. We'll be back again tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. I'm Andrew Schmertz.